So let's talk just a little bit about the pediatric ear exam. Let's start with a case study. You're conducting a newborn exam on a baby born at 30, uh, about 36 hours ago, and you are inspecting the ear, and this is what you note here. So what additional information is needed? Um, you're going to decide using this algorithm. So you want a careful family history, history of this child and a physical exam. And if the history is positive for family history of deafness, family history of ear anomalies or renal anomalies, or, and or any positive history of gestational diabetes, then a renal ultrasound is in order. What additional tests do you think are needed on this child? Patients with uh, ear anomalies can be carefully assessed for accompanying dysmorphic features. Um, you want to look for any facial asymmetry, any colobomas of the lid, iris or retina, uh, coanal atresia, jaw hypoplasia. Um, you're really going to do a careful assessment for any of those additional anomalies. And I have a slide coming up with some pictures of those and all of the highlights of what those look like as well. Um, but we want to carefully uh, evaluate. We have to have an auditory brainstem response evaluation. This baby's hearing has to be evaluated, a complete history and a complete physical as well as the pregnancy history. So here are some of those uh, congenital anomaly syndromes that can have an abnormal ear. And so you're going to examine this baby carefully for any dysmorphic features. Is there any facial asymmetry? The coloboma, which is on the right upper hand photograph on the slide, any jaw hypoplasia, which you see on the photograph on the upper left hand side, brachial cleft cysts or sinuses with some drainage coming out of the child's neck. It's just saliva. It's a track to the back of the uh, or to the um, pharyngeal area. And so you can have secretions coming from the neck. Uh, cardiac murmurs, children need to be assessed carefully for any cardiac defect. And then um, you can have co-occurring distal limb anomalies or an imperforate or ectopic anus. So very careful uh, physical exam is in order. I think I forgot to mention the coanal atresia, which is on the right hand side of the slide um, where that uh, nasal passage is just smaller underdeveloped. So let's just review briefly the ear anatomy and physiology. Mainly the external ear, the purpose is to transmit the sound waves to the middle ear. And of course that external auditory canal and your cerumen help to clear the debris from the air. And then um, just keep in mind that fetal development of the ear is simultaneous with the kidneys. And that's why you sometimes will have co-occurring renal anomalies. Then you have the tympanic um, membrane or the tympanic cavity itself is called the middle ear. But the tympanic membrane kind of separates that external ear from the middle ear. And there's that small chamber in the temporal bones that contain the ossicles, the malleus incus and stapes, and the purpose there is to transmit the sound waves to the inner ear. This slide is a nice um, depiction of the anatomy of the different parts of the ear. So your external ear has your oracle or your your penna. It has that external auditory canal and then the tympanic membrane which separates the external ear from the middle ear. And then the middle ear has your malleus incus and stapes 
and then the internal ear has your semicircular canals, the vestibula and uh, cochlea, and then your auditory nerve, which transmits the, the nerve impulse to the sound. And then note the eustachian tube as well, draining that middle ear. Another important part of the anatomy is the eustachian tube. And the eustachian tube has the purpose of um, ventilating that middle ear. It also offers protection from nasopharyngeal sound pressure and secretions. The popping in the ears, um, yawning and popping in the ears when you're at altitude helps equalize pressure. And then also, um, it takes care of drainage of secretions from the middle ear. And then your inner ear um, transmits the sound and aids in balance. This slide just depicts the difference in the anatomy of the eustachian tube between an infant and an adult. And you can see in the infant that it is almost uh, horizontal where there's very little incline. And so the secretions in the back of the posterior pharynx can actually drain into the child's middle ear. And that's why we discourage bottle propping in the infants and it makes them high, at higher risk of middle ear infections. By the time they reach older uh, um, childhood and adult, there's a little more of a, a slant or an incline to that eustachian tube, and it decreases the risks of the middle ear infections. Another defense mechanism is the cerumen, and debris is formed by keratinizing cells in the ear that's lubricated and then um, kind of pushed to the external auditory canal by cilia. And the pH in the external auditory canal is, is very acidic, um, and so it prevents the growth of bacteria. It's also water resistant and has a lot of lymph and blood supply and is really protective. So it's critically important as you start to go doing your otoscopic exam in the children that you remember most of the nerve fibers are at the proximal end of the external auditory canal. So if you keep that otoscope uh, in the very distal end, it shouldn't be uncomfortable for the child. Removal of cerumen is not necessary unless it's critical that you be able to visualize the tympanic membrane or if you think it's the cause of some hearing loss. Removal can be done with the scoop, but remember that the, the further into that external auditory canal you get, the more blood supply and close the ner closer the nerve endings are, and it's going to be very painful. Um, some people choose to irrigate with some baking soda solution, colace, or hydrogen peroxide. Uh, parents can be told to get Ceruminex over the counter. Um, it works quite effectively, uh, but the downside to Ceruminex is it's very drying, and so it actually causes the external auditory canal to produce more Ceruminex, so it can become sort of a vicious cycle. Um, and if you choose to irrigate, be very careful. Um, don't use high pressure irrigation. Um, it can actually rupture the tympanic membrane. Now we're going to get a careful history and you want to know the past medical history. Um, we want to know if this child has any craniofacial abnormalities, Down syndrome, cleft lip or cleft palate, any syndromes associated with ear problems, and um, past surgery on the ears, any history of prematurity or medications in the newborn period, and any diabetes mellitus. And uh, as we mentioned before, a family history of hearing problems or ear anomalies and history of, of kidney malformations. So some of the syndromes that can cause problems for this little person's hearing are Pierre Robin syndrome, and that usually includes a cleft palate, 
the retronathia, which is, as this baby has this small jaw, they'll have um, also the macroglossia. And then Treacher-Collins syndrome. And this um, is a classic uh, depiction of Treacher-Collins with the eyes slanting down, the small jaw and chin. They have hearing loss, vision loss, and they may also have a co-occurring cleft palate. Cleft lip and cleft palate can be um, alone or together and can be unilateral or bilateral. And very frequent ear infections go along with a cleft palate. When you're seeing a child with any type of ear complaint, you want to get a History of the present illness. Are they having pain? Are there any associated symptoms? Is there fever? With infants, very often there's vomiting and diarrhea associated with any type of illness, nasal congestion, upper respiratory symptoms, and a persistent cough can be present. The ear pain or otalgia, you want to pay attention to where that uh, where that pain is coming from. So inspect carefully, but also palpate um, the external ear. As you palpate the tragus and move the penna, it will be painful with otitis externa. You want to also uh, pay attention to the possibility of any herpes zoster. Any uh, furuncles, which is an infection around the hair follicle. Frostbite can also cause uh, external pain, foreign bodies can cause pain, and cerumen impaction can cause external pain. The middle uh, ear pain is usually from acute or chronic otitis media, some type of trauma, change in pressure, so barotrauma, mastoiditis, and that pain will be behind the ear uh, in the mastoid process area, and then uh, tumor can cause middle ear pain. You can also have referred pain, um, and that's from temporal mandibular joint, TMJ, uh, dental pain, and sinusitis. The history of the present illness also should include, are they having ear itching or discharge, any ringing in the ears or hearing loss, and exposure to any risk factors. Is the child a swimmer? Is there ex external um, environmental tobacco smoke exposure? Is there any bottle propping? Are they in daycare? And um, for, the, for the inner ear, is there exposure to loud no noises? And then on examination, you're going to carefully inspect this ear. Are there... Um, Is the position of the ear normal and uh, are the uh, structures symmetrical? Are there any skin tags or skin abnormalities? Is there any discharge, any other lesions? And then you want to look, draw a line from the inner canthus to the outer canthus and then extend that line back to the ear. And the top of the pinna should lie at, at, at or above that line, that imaginary line that you've drawn from the inner canthus to the outer canthus. So you can see in our photos below, A is a normal position, B is a normal position, and we call that um, pseudo low set ears because on inspection, if you don't draw the line from the inner canthus to the outer canthus, it might look like that ear is a little low set. Um, but in reality, it's fine. And then C um, is a true low set ear. And again, those low set ears, that's a dysmorphic feature and um, needs further workup. Here's the preauricular skin tags that you could see. Here's an example of a preauricular pit, and it can have a sinus tract with us, with that, that frequently will get infected. Here's a preauricular cyst. There's the pit and then the cyst that forms um, when that tract gets infected. So you're going to do careful observation. You're going to 
ask about the developmental uh, milestones related to hearing. Does this parent think the child can hear? Um, is the child producing intelligible speech by the age of two? And if it's um, largely not understandable by age three, the child needs referred. If there are omissions of certain consonants after three, um, and if there are not sentences by the age of three. And these can be short sentences, but um, they, they need to be putting words together by three. And if there is an excessive amount of, of kind of babbling or unintelligible um, speech by 18 months. Now remember um, that you're going to palpate and rotate that external ear for tenderness and inflammation. You're going to palpate the tragus and you're going to apply pressure to the mastoid. And then for your otoscopic exam, infants and small children, remember to pull the pinna down and out and back so that um, it straightens that external auditory canal. Um, and then for younger children, you're just going to pull back on the pinna to straighten that canal. And then older children, it's actually the same as adults. You pull the pinna up and backward to straighten the canal. Here's just um, a good reminder of the proper way to hold the otoscope when you go to do the exam in children. And as you see in your upper right hand, uh, corner of the slide, you're going to hold it sort of like a pencil and your uh, extra, your small finger is going to actually be um, on anchored on the child's head so you don't accidentally move that otoscope in too far into the canal if the child suddenly moves their head. You're going to examine the external auditory canal for redness, edema, and discharge. And your goal is to assess 360 degrees of the tympanic membrane. And the major part of the trick to this is straightening that canal. So look for landmarks. Use the pneumatoscope um, to uh, check for mobility. Look for any fluid levels, any retraction or perforation. And I like to use the example of holding the flashlight at the door of a dark room. You don't need to put the flashlight deep into the room to see that back wall. You just have to stand at the door and move your flashlight around until you see all of it. So straighten the canal and then stay at the door of the um, external auditory canal and move your light and it shouldn't be painful to the child. Here's an example of a normal tympanic membrane. You can see the landmarks, you can see a light reflex. There's a, a few blood vessels visible right along there with the landmarks. Um, I would say a, a little mild injection, but pretty much a normal tympanic membrane. This slide is just a diagram of the various structures behind the tympanic membrane and help you with describing any abnormalities that you may see on the tympanic membrane. So um, it may be described as injection along the malleus, uh, scar tissue below the umbo, uh, perforation in the pars tensa. Um, it's just a, a nice way for you to be able to describe the specifics of what you're seeing when you do the examination of the tympanic membrane. Um, the pneumatic otoscopy is essential for checking the mobility of the eardrum and that gives us lots of information about otitis media and whether or not there's a fusion. Other diagnostic tools, you can use a tympanometer um, uh, and test for mobility. And I have a picture of one coming up. You can use acoustical reflectrometry um, and detect the presence of middle ear effusion that way as well. And um, I don't think it's going to be routine practice for most nurse practitioners, but ENT clinics frequently will um, perform tympanocentesis to take some fluid out if there's a chronic ear infection or a chronic problem that can't be cleared up. Um, 
and if there's any question of perinatal infection or, or systemic illness, kidney dysfunction, um, they, uh, they may get additional tests there as well. So here's an example of the um, uh, one type of tympanometer. And um, here is what your readout will look, look like um, when you get the tympanometer um, reading. And the A curve is a normal curve. The B curve is a flat curve with decreased mobility of the tympanic membrane. So let's say this kid has an otitis media with a fusion and that um, that tympanic membrane's not moving at all. That's what your reading will look like. The C curve is with negative pressure, so you may have a kid with a retracted eardrum, so you'll get the curve or the or the peak sooner than you thought um, you should. Again, this is just another um, example of the tools you can use, and um, this is the reflectometry, and this is the tympanocentesis. So let's go over some of the terminology. I know this is a review for you. You've had it, but otitis externa is inflammation in that external auditory canal. Um, foreign bodies, acute otitis media, if you have a purulent uh, drainage behind the tympanic membrane, otitis media with effusion is when it's non-purulent fluid behind the TM. So here's a slide of otitis externa. You can see there's inflammation, there's exudate, there's a few hyphae there. There's more hyphae in this uh, particular slide and that goes along with fungal infections. And this is another example of, of a profound uh, fungal otitis externa. There's uh, inflammation, there's hyphae, there's exudate and um, the external auditory canal is almost totally occluded. Here's an example of an otitis externa with a furuncle, um, and you can, you can see that it's an infection of a hair follicle. You can also have a carbuncle where there's a group of hair follicles that have become infected, um, and uh, frequently these need to be lanced so they drain. Treatment of otitis externa is de debridement with a cotton tip applicator, and then you can use the over-the-counter over burrow solution, which is aluminum triacetate. Um, ear drops can sometimes be prescribed if it's, if it's uh, severely inflamed. Steroids combined with antibiotics are useful. Um, quinolones are, are um, useful for the fungal infections and can be applied using the wick. Uh, just if you have a lot of edema there, it's good to get the wick in place so that the eardrops go to the, um, the distal part of the external auditory canal. Treatment for otitis externa, pain management is important, Tylenol and comfort measures, aralgan can be used, um, you have to lance any furuncles so they will drain and follow up is critically important. If this is a persistent problem, you may need to culture. And if, um, the, if it can't be cleared up in a timely fashion, referral to ENT is indicated. Treatment of foreign bodies, you're going to use your ear scoop or your bayonet forceps to try to remo remove those foreign bodies. Insects need to be um, killed before you flush them out, and you can um, do that with, with ethanol, vinegar, or alcohol. Um, irrigation is useful, except in the case of a battery or vegetable matter, or I would say a lot of candy I've found in kids' ears, like Skittles. Uh, swell up if you irrigate, so um, if you can't remove them with your scoop or your bayonet forceps, refer to ENT. I wouldn't do a lot of manipulation. The more you irritate that canal, the more it swells, the harder it is to get these things out. So if you can't remove them, refer to ENT. Here's some examples of um, otitis media with 
uh, uh, acute otitis media and otitis media with effusion. And the really great news is that a lot of the cases of otitis media um, have been decreased with uh, the new um, vaccinations that are available for us to use and the change in schedule and giving those immunizations early in infancy, we really have decreased the prevalence of otitis media from uh, pneumococcal and from the Haemophilus influenza type B. And we also encourage the annual influenza vaccines because that's another organism that can cause otitis media in these um, smaller children. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that the bacteriostatic gums are um, useful in decreasing incidence, so like xylitol containing gum. We know avoiding bottle propping can prevent kids from pooling those secretions in the posterior pharynx that drain uh, via the the eustachian tube to the middle ear. Avoiding pacifiers has been um, linked to uh, decreasing the incidence of otitis media. Breastfeeding until four months can be beneficial. Um, we want to discuss with the families drug resistance and really use antibiotics do judiciously. We know the majority of these infections are viral and so the watchful waiting uh, is is the uh, current recommendation and you'll get more of this um, when you do your acute and chronic illness courses. Um, and then we know less crowded daycares or daycares in homes with fewer children is suggested to prevent frequent um, infections in the infant. Management. Um, so our biggest problem is the eustachian tube dysfunction and um, we don't really have any magic uh, a way to change that. There have been a variety of different things tried, decongestants and um, steroids, and, it, and none of those have been found um, useful. So we usually choose to um, treat or use the watchful waiting and careful education of the families. Um, to watch the child and watch for signs of fever or mastoiditis in the um, perforation, they need to come back in. But again, we usually try with the watchful waiting. These are some slides with tympanic membrane perforation. And again, you want to document the size and the location of those perforations and see those children back to make sure this is healed up. A management of otitis media with effusion, you're going to document each episode and identify the kids who are at risk. They can end up with a developmental delay around their speech and hearing, and um, that can result in cognitive and behavioral problems. Um, we know there's some ethnic groups that are at higher uh, risk for otitis media with effusion, and um, craniofacial defects put kids at higher risk. So again, you do watchful waiting, and if it's persistent, um, refer to ENT for uh, tubes. Management strategies. Um, obviously, we are going to be concerned about follow-up and referral as needed. So if there's any unusual ear conditions or there's congenital malformations, craniofacial abnormalities, any sensory dysfunction, all of those things need referral to ENT. Um, audiology referral, uh, if the child cannot hear, and speech and language evaluations, uh, if there's delays in, in speech development. And then, of course, if it's a chronic problem, we're going to refer for um, for consideration of pressure equalizing tubes. Here's a slide with a tube in place, and that's a well-healed um, scar there. So referral to ENT for consideration of tubes. 
uh, is indicated in any child with sustained hearing loss that's moderate to severe, if they have questionable language and speech development, frequent or severe episodes of acute otitis media, regular exposure to large numbers of children and they keep getting recurrent upper respiratory infections, followed with secondary uh, otitis media, a history of adverse reactions to antibiotics, kids with the craniofacial abnormalities that we've talked about or the syndromes, the at-risk children who have cognitive, sensory, physical, or behavioral delays, um, and the kid with chronic otitis media that just won't clear up over four months and you can't get rid of that effusion, any kid with structural damage to the tympanic membrane, lots of scar tissue on that TM, or structural damage to the middle ear, complications of otitis media or otitis media with effusion, um, all of those are indications for referral for consideration of tubes. Coleostoma is another um, condition that you may see and that needs referral right away, mastoiditis needs referral right away, and polyps in the ear canal need referred. So here's just a couple slides with coleostoma. Here's mastoiditis and actually a mastoid abscess. You know also it's critically important to have the newborn screening and documentation that that was uh, done in the nursery and that the child passed and, um, and then you want to include uh, follow-up at three months if there's any abnormalities and treatment by six months of age if the child has hearing loss. In the office you're going to do audiometry. Uh, the, the infants can't be assessed in your office so they're going to be referred for the visual reinforcement audiometry and that's in the in the picture on the upper right hand side of the slide and they can also use conditioned play audiometry. Um, the pure tone audiometry that you do in the office is depicted at the bottom of the slide and um, Bright Futures recommendations are that we do it at um, the annual physicals. Interpreting those findings of the audiometry, if the child can hear at, at 0 to 25 decibels, that's normal. It's the same as faint speech. If the child can hear at 26 to 40 decibels, that's mild loss and it's normal speech. If the child can hear at 41 to 55 decibels, that's moderate loss and that's a, a little bit louder normal speech. 71 to 90 decibels is severe loss and that's loud speech only that they can hear. And over 90 decibels is profound and that's amplified speech is all they can hear. Um, so any concerns with failed audiometry um, are referred. There's different types of hearing loss that children can have and they're sensory neural, conductive, and combined. And sensory neural is usually caused by damage to the cochlear structure of the inner ear or the fibers of the auditory nerve. Um, and noise in induced really loud noise exposure is the most common cause. Conductive hearing loss is usually caused by either occlusion of the external auditory canal by a foreign body or impaction of cerumen or an infection in the middle ear or that chronic uh, effusion can cause decreased mobility um, and then you can have mixed a combination of the two. Risk factors for hearing loss, um, sensory neural hearing loss, uh, kids who've been in the NICU for more than a couple of days, kids with syndromes, family history, congenital infections, craniofacial abnormalities, and any administration of ototoxic drugs. Um, genomycin in that newborn period is certainly a risk factor. We also ki know kids with a low birth weight, uh, under 1,500 grams, kids with hyperbilirubinemia, um, and severe enough with causing kernicterus, those kids are at risk. 
severe respiratory depression at birth, and prolonged mechanical ventilation for more than 10 days are risk factors. Children uh, one month to three years of age that um, are diagnosed with a kidney malformation, parent or caregiver concerns, that's always a red flag, family history, which we've already mentioned, syndromes, which we've already mentioned, and um, any syndromes uh, associated with progressive hearing loss, like, um, for example, we see children with neurofibromatosis, and um, those can also be in neurodegenerative disorders like Hunter's disease. Kids can have hearing loss. So again, failure to learn to speak at the appropriate ages, failure to respond to um, voice or auditory stimuli. Children who have an abnormal monotone speech or avoidance of speaking, any kid who fails a school audiogram or um, the hearing screening in your office. If you can't understand a child's speech, if the parents complain they have the TV volume really high, or aggression or behavioral complaints, um, physical complaints of the child, any social difficulties, and uh, any history of loud noise exposure should be evaluated. So in conclusion, um, I just want you to get in the habit of really carefully assessing every ear, every well child exam, do a careful examination of the ear. This is a skill that you will develop over time, and if you practice on every single child, um, it's just going to get better. Your skills are going to get better. Good luck and have fun with it.